Josh, take it away, my man. Always with the James. My middle name is not nor ever will be James. It could be. Alan. Yes. Ta. You, you have to take those sunglasses off. You look stupid. <laughs> I love you. Hi, everybody. All right. Uh, I'm not going to waste a lot of time uh, because we have questions to get to. They're already coming in. Make sure you text your question to that number. Through the miracle of science, they will end up on this computer. Um, and then I will read them because I have graduated. Um, so, most of you know me. My name is Tosh Allen James Andrew. There, I added it for you. Uh, I am here because they had to have a host. Um, Everybody else is here for amazing and wonderful reasons. So without further ado, we will start on my left and go this way for introductions. I am John Guidry. I am here because I have uh, three young adults in my home that are my, my children who are among you. And so I've answered a question or two and hopefully modeled a thing or two. I also work with businesses every day who pay my staff and me to tell them what to do with their money. And so hopefully through their mistakes and my own, I've learned enough that I can help you avoid those mistakes. How's that? Cool? Like it. Hey, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, you look amazing. Give yourself a hand, please. You do. Uh, not too long ago, I was like you, younger. And uh, God's brought me through a lot of journeys from that point and has taught me a lot about the heart behind what we do with our money and our resources, not just money. And uh, I hope to share that with you tonight. Thank you. To the Coleman's. All right. Uh, I'm Chad. This is my wife, Jennifer. We've been uh, attending Praise as a married couple for since grade six. And... Uh, been leading the Financial Peace University now for a year with our praise. And so we're just passionate about helping you guys out with uh, learning how to handle finances God's way. So look forward to it. The ministers of finance. All right, we'll jump right in. Uh, first question, we're starting off with a doozy. When it comes, when it, or I, I can read, I told you. When I come across a homeless person asking for money, what should I do? I'm scared to be an enabler. I'll leave it up to y'all. Don't everybody attack it at once. I will. Uh, we've, through the years, one of our, one of our hearts' passions has, has been helping those in, in that very situation. When, um, when, when I was in my early 20s, uh, I worked with a <laughs> church in Galveston and uh, doing student ministry among among other things. So a lot of the work I did was at night and would have to, uh, you know, go back and back to my office. Often I would have to climb over a homeless person sleeping under the covered stoop of the entrance to our church offices and such. So I, I got to know some on a first name basis and some of them had six or seven names as they manifested the many personalities that they had, some interesting ones. And uh, so, so right then, I had the heart that just said, man, just, just anything. And then I just started to learn. I started to watch. And, and long story short, I'll just bring it down to this, is that there is a kind of helping that hurts. All right? There is a kind of helping that hurts. Now, I'm all for, and I don't try to temper the fact that, uh, that uh, you know, in as much as you've done unto the least of me, uh, the least of these, you've done it unto me. I don't, you know, I, I, I get that. I get the, the, the reaching out and, and helping anyone fully and doing all that you can. Um, but I, I also understand the, the role of, look, it's just part of being in and out of season, being ready in and out of season with an answer for your faith, Right? Part of that is that when you are confronted with that kind of opportunity, 
you need to be ready. It doesn't need to be the first time you've thought of it. You, it doesn't need to be the first time that day that you've prayed and said, God, I want your guidance. It doesn't need to be the first time that month that you've had a ministry thought, okay? You live in a prepared way. That qualifies you to be able to do God's work in those areas when you're given those opportunities. Um, I personally do not, just in passing, I personally do not give cash. But I also don't lie and say, man, I don't, I don't have, you know, I've got some spare change, I don't have any. I don't say that. Now, actually, it's probably true a lot of times. I don't carry cash very often, but... Uh, I, I, I don't say that. I use it as an opportunity to say, I, that, I can't help you there, but let's talk about how I can help you. And then the response you get to that question really tells where things can go from there, in all honesty. Now, that, that's, that's my approach. It's not perfect. It, it's different every time because I just I know I have to listen to the Holy Spirit and be daring enough to obey what he says to do in that moment regardless of what it is. Yeah, one point I was listening to a, a Keller sermon the other day, and he was talking about this specifically, and he stated that the, one of the main, main drivers for us giving reactively to people is not being prepared, not being intentional, not planning ahead, not being investing and in giving as God wants us to. Uh, it's a, a conscience, you know, it hurts our conscience to see this, and we know we're not doing enough, so we're giving reactively. He said, we need to give intentionally with purpose, intentionality, and responsibility. And those occasions can be used to leverage learning about a person, learning about their heart, learning why they are where they are, and build a relationship through that opportunity, not necessarily giving them cash. Find out what the real need is. Remember, uh, I believe it was Paul or Peter, uh, one of those. Yeah, one of the big boys. Church. One of the big boys. One of the big guys. Uh, walking up, and he said, I don't have any cash to give, but mm -hmm. let me share with you mm -hmm. about the grace and the gospel mm -hmm. of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That's what it's all about. Yes, he said, gold and silver have I none, but what I do have I give to you. You know, the just to add to that, there was a time, you know, I'm, I'm an Old Testament junkie, right? So in the Old Testament, they didn't bring cash to the temple, right? They had to bring a lamb. There were certain sacrifices they had to bring, and they had to buy them. But God made provision for people who didn't have a lot. He said, what you have, bring. And it's the same concept. What you have, give. If you have joy, give joy. If you have love, give love. If you have the grace of the Father, give grace. Cash only goes so far, but kindness takes people places you never imagined. Anything you'd like to add before we go to the next question? All right, next question. Let me, let me just yes, say it's le most of the time in that related to that mm. question specifically, it's less about an investment of your money and more mm -hmm. about an investment of your time, your consciousness, mm -hmm. and um, just you having some forethought to – you know, maybe be prepared. In Beaumont, you're going to run into those people. If that's your heart. Keep some, keep some snacks in the car. Keep some yeah. socks in the car. Things that you can give away. I mean, just little things like yeah. that. But it's it's less about your money and more Absolutely. about your time and your sensitivity to the Lord. Absolutely. Yeah. I liked what you you both said. It it requires a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit to know what to do, when to do it. All right. Speaking of. How can you be sure that you're making a sound financial decision? You want to start with that one, Chad? Okay. Um, well, <coughs> there's uh, lots of decisions you make financially, so uh, there, there could be many areas for that question that's, that's, a, that's a little bit vague, but I'm assuming we're going to be talking about mainly personal finance. Yeah. And so... Uh, for that topic, there there are uh, you know for the class that we teach, there are specific guides and steps that you take, small baby steps in making making those decisions. And um, we could you know we could we could go through the details. Uh, I, I think that uh, the best thing to do is to go through the class if you really want to learn the details. But there, 
it's not overly complicated. There's 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 three main priorities you want to uh, you know center your personal finances around, which is uh, you know tithing, saving, and spending. So uh, whenever you're trying to prioritize what you're going to do with your money, you want to uh, ensure that you're uh, you know you have something in, in those three buckets. Uh, there's there's a whole lot of reason in each of those buckets that mm -hmm. you do these things, but the, m the main thing I think that you want to make sure, uh, you know, that you're thinking about is uh, when you're making financial decisions is your behaviors because financial, uh, you know, personal finance is uh, about 20% knowledge. That's meaning understanding, uh, you know, how to balance a checkbook, understanding how to, uh, you know, wh where to invest money and things like that. It's about 20% knowledge. The rest of it is 80% behavior. So. You know, if when you when you when you talk about the Bibles, there there are, I don't know, Bible Bible guy, <laughs> but there's there's tons and tons of verses about uh, how to handle money in the Bible. So I think I think that uh, God knew that we were going to struggle with it, and so there's lots of guidance in there, and it's it's all around behavior. It's how how you behave. Uh, you know, if if you give in to, or you follow kind of the what we're marketed to, the culture, the things that you know you're going to spend everything that. All, every penny that comes in, you're going to spend going out and then not save anything. And there's specific uh, guidance around that uh, in the Bible. You know, you should, you should, uh, you know, give give a portion of what your income is to to uh, the church or to to a ministry. Uh, you need to save some for yourself for a rainy day, and then the rest of it is what you use for spending. And so, uh, you know, so yeah, and you're you hit on something that by the questions is an elephant in the room. So we just need to go ahead and get it out there because I'm looking at multiple questions, all in some form of this question. I'm a student or I just graduated. I have a lot of debt. I can barely pay my bills. So why does God require me to tithe? So if we could just for a minute, let's talk about debt and tithe and how that plays into our the choices we make and the church and how it sets us up for success or failure. So, uh, for, for first and foremost, understand that uh, God doesn't need your money, right? He He owns He owns it all, right? He owns the He owns what's it, the land that was it cattle on a thousand. Yep. Years ago? Um, so I mean, you know, uh, Dave Ramsey says it's kind of funny. He says if if God wanted your money, He'd take it, and there'd be a greasy spot where you're sitting, right? I mean, <laughs> It's not. It's not about that. So why? Why? Why does he ask you to give? Well, as I said earlier, you know, uh, the the Bible is just littered with verses around how to handle money. So uh, knowing that it's going to be a problem, you know, uh, whenever you whenever you're committed to, uh, or or when you get to the point where you realize that everything is his, um, the the act of giving that first ten percent of your income. What it does is it sets your heart up to be in the right place. It's it's not about it's not about uh, God and your money. It's about uh, praising Him for what He's given you, and then also setting yourself in a position to be a giver, right? God God is the ultimate giver, right? I mean, He He sent His Son to die for our sins. I mean, that is the ultimate gift. So if we're made in His image to be givers, then that instruction that He gives. 10% off the top goes back to the ministry for his kingdom. That That is a heart thing. It's a heart thing for you. It's not It's not something, and it's not a salvation issue either, right? It's not you, you, It's not whether you're saved or not if you give or not. It's, it's about living your life, and it's about a heart and a heart thing for you. Um, I feel like I'm getting off. No, you're going right where I wanted. You said heart. You said the magic word. <laughs> Yeah, just a couple Go comments ahead. to that. First of all, <coughs> number one, congratulations. You are part of the 10% of the world population that may be able to even think about money and saving and having a future of being able to invest money. Most of the world will never have that option, right? They're put in a place they are. It's just by pure chance and possibly God's grace, depending on your perspective, that you weren't born in the mountains of Slovakia raising sheep and have no options of what to do with your future except raise sheep, right? Because that's what your family does, all right? 
So we're here in America, and because we have these responsibilities, we have this opportunity, we have the responsibility to be wise stewards of what God gives us. Right? Do we agree? Yep. All right. <laughs> yes, sir. I like it. All right. Uh, so we have responsibility to be wise stewards of what God gives us. Debt can be managed. Now, personally, I hate debt. Right, I was born with depression era grandparents that trained me on um, finances, and they said never get in debt. So I never got in debt. Um, some of us have not had that luxury or ability to work to be able to pay off debt, and I get that. You are where you are. You have to deal with it. You have to manage it. But the key of all of this is where is our heart? What is the purpose of why we do what we do? We can talk all about investing and saving and where you want to be and how to set your family up and how to get debt free and that's all great, but why are we doing it? And for so many years, my purpose of doing it was to be successful, to be free, to be liberated from the bondage of debt. I hated it. I didn't feel like I could give my church because I was in debt. I didn't feel like I could help other people out because I, uh, of debt, you know, of obligation. And I couldn't stand those um, bounds, right? So the purpose of why we do what we do is to glorify God. Do we agree that's why we are here, to glorify God? And the spirit we need to approach it in is what does Jesus say? Poor in spirit. Over and over, he talks about being poor in spirit. Now, what does that mean? That means having a humble attitude, understanding that everything we have is from God's grace. A middle-class spirit, being middle-class in spirit, means I approach life like I go to church, I do my stuff, I give my money, I'm good, right, God? Being poor in spirit understands the concept that nothing I do will ever earn me the ability to go to heaven, to be clean before God. Everything I do, everything I say, everything I do, even though I have what I think are the best motivations are filthy rags before God, and I deserve nothing but hell for it. That's being poor in spirit. And if that offends you, we probably need to question where is your spirit? Where is your focus? Is it on God? All right. So that's great, but there are some mechanics we have to talk about, and that's saving, that's investing, and doing it with the right heart. If we have that heart, we will prioritize our finances to glorify God most to it. We will give our tithe, and again, you know, Chad does a great job of helping people organize their day-to-day -day, um, spending habits and getting to a point where they can give and eventually be free to give more. So that's the goal, to glorify God in our lives, and we have the opportunity to do that, so let's take it. Let me, let me come at, at that. I, I, I think this, in a lot of ways, is a central question yes. too, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Let me come at it from a let me come at it from a little bit different angle. Give you a little bit different perspective, and I'll preface this by saying I 100% agree with everything that's been said. Okay, so that said, I want to take it and let's let's think about this context that Jesus spoke into, that Philip just just talked about, and it was people of the law coming to him mm -hmm. and asking questions about the law, and so they maybe they said. Uh, so, so Jesus responds to them and says, you've heard it said, thou shalt not murder. Everybody goes, well, yeah. And he says, I say don't hate your brother because you've committed murder in your heart. I, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. I would say, and you don't have lust in your heart. And, and he went on. He took everything that was a provision of the law, and he didn't just double down on it. He completely confiscated it right there on the spot and, yeah. and drew it to himself and, and made it a matter of the heart like he's talking about. So I want to do the same thing with the, this, this question with your budget, with your finances, with your stream of 
your cash flow. I want to take that and I want to put it in a completely different perspective. Don't think about it in terms of 10% and, and a 11% interest rate and a this much going to rent. And just take all of that away and just make it 100% it's God's. Yeah. 100% belongs to him. And he has given you, if you are a believer in Christ, he has given you his Holy Spirit to walk with you, to dwell in you, to speak to you. He himself said he will teach you and guide you in all things. Yeah. Is money a thing? Yes. Money is a thing. You'll hear these guys before the night's over. You'll hear all of us probably say money's a tool. Okay. Mm -hmm. it, money's a thing. And he used the word all. So if he is going to instruct you in all things, does all of your money qualify as all things? It does. Mm -hmm. All right. So you already have the greatest tool on board mm -hmm. in order to know how to manage your money to listen to him. That mm -hmm. said, it also is going to, uh, as, as the Coleman's really represent, it's, it's going to help you plan some behaviors. It's going to help you make some decisions that set you up to be able to hear his voice. Do you know it's harder to hear him tell you give $1,000 to this person or this cause if you have $999 in the bank and a, and a $1,500 of rent and a $500 car payment due tomorrow. Yeah. Right? It's harder to hear that and be obedient to it. So there are definitely some behaviors, but it all, I think, begins with a commitment from you at this point that says, you know what, this is, all, this is not about a 10% law anymore. This is about a 100% God. Mm -hmm. who held nothing back from yeah. me, who poured himself out, flesh and blood, on my behalf, used all of his power to raise Christ from the dead, and now he just wants to speak to me about what to do with this little bit of money that he's entrusted me mm -hmm. with. I think I can handle that. All right, so that said, I think it's important for you guys to be asking that question and beginning to build behaviors that set you up for success in obeying his voice at this stage of your life because you haven't amassed as many mistakes as I have by the time we get to, to my <laughs> age, right? You, you have a little cleaner slate. Some of you think, you haven't looked at my bank account lately. I don't know. I mean, yeah, it's a clean slate, all right, but, you know. <laughs> yeah. you know but you, you are at a point where there are a lot of things that could be hindrances to my radical obedience that you haven't even gotten to yet. Mm -hmm. So let's do them right as you approach them. As you, as, as you see somebody roll down the road in that, that sweet ride, mm -hmm. you've got to make some decisions now about how you're going to process that thought and, mm -hmm. and where that needs to fit into to your life. And as far as the specifics of that, how do I... You know, how do I pay down my debt and, and still give? The, the first principle that I'll, that I'll tell you is when it comes to your giving, stop thinking about it as a check that's dropped in an offering bucket or a credit card entry that goes through a website. Stop thinking about it like that. And I want you to get invested in your giving. You may still give everything you give through a church. I have no problem with that. You may do it some other ways. That's between you and the Lord. I really believe that. But what I want you to do, no matter how you choose to give, is you invest yourself in it and make that giving about people. Mm -hmm. Put a face on it. Put a life on it. I know that if I don't generate X amount of money, that my buddy Kevin in the Philippines cannot operate in a ministry that has literally transformed the lives of thousands of the poorest Filipinos in the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. I know that. And so no matter what, come hell or high water, he's getting that money. Mm -hmm. I go without before he does. Right? Mm -hmm. So it really becomes a matter of the flesh versus the spirit. When, it, when you're faced with, I've got this huge student loan interest payment or this huge, whatever the commitment is, I've got this and I've got this and I've got this. How can I give? 
My question is flip that around and say, how could they go without? And what can I do without? Mm -hmm. I, it's really that simple. Let me, uh, <coughs> so we, we got the heart, we got the heart issue covered, right? <laughs> yeah. So let me, let me give you a, a few mechanics, okay, which is what a lot, a lot what the FTE class is about, mechanics. So you, you still kind of have, oh, that's great. Okay, I'm praying. Uh, I'm praying God help me see where I need to give. But, you know, at the end of the month, there's still nothing there, right? So, so a few mechanics. Uh, first and foremost is, uh, like, like um, uh, Philip alluded to, no debt. So if you have credit cards and et cetera and all that now, uh, you know, the, the more you keep using the credit card, you're, you're digging yourself further into the hole, right? So, but you can't just stop. You know, if that's the only thing you have, you can't just stop using credit cards, right? So the very first baby step in FTE is uh, a, what, what they call a baby emergency fund. And I would think, I'm not sure, but I would think for maybe um, college and young adults, they, they say the, the baby emergency fund is $1,000 cash in the bank. Now that is for set aside for emergencies. I would think that if you're uh, maybe in college with a much less of an income, could probably be five hundred dollars uh, would probably be a good start start with that the the very next thing you have to do you must do no matter what you're doing anywhere any sort any level of finance how much income you make you you must have a plan uh, we printed out a couple of forms you can start with you can just write it down but what you want to do is you list everything every expense every month right that you that, that you have to pay and your income and you every dollar of your income you have to assign it to something and the way and what you're doing when you start getting into that habit of doing that now you're now you're being proactive right you might see some things that you didn't see before hey look money is uh, <coughs> money's dynamic right if you don't tell your money where to go it's going somewhere right you have to be proactive and tell your money where it's going to go and what it's going to do that is uh, God call for that's that's being a good steward when you put your stuff down on paper on purpose ahead of when it comes in you're you you get to be the steward at that point right you don't have uh, the bank uh, you know calling you or you don't have people calling you and and, and just taking your money um, going to all the bills and, and be proactive with it so that would be the first couple of things I would say right away you know uh, save up some cash and start doing a plan and mm -hmm. then then you can see where where things are going and where you can make adjustments maybe you can sell something there's all sorts of ways to start getting out of debt and you know if you if you really need help we're always here we're, we're plugged in with the church uh, you know you, you can find us through Jimmy through Todd anybody and, and we're willing to sit with you and help talk through some things and ultimately go go through the FTE class too it's huge I wish I'd have done it <laughs> a lot earlier yeah. Absolutely. It's one of the best things Tammy and I did as a married couple. Uh, just to give you a quick story, there's a lot of questions in here about I'm graduating or I'm about to graduate or I've graduated and I'm X dollars in debt. I haven't seen a number bigger than 7500 in credit card debt, right? And I'm not, I, I, I didn't mean to say that belittling. I j I'm just here to tell you when I graduated college in 1999, I was $30,000 in credit card debt. And all I had to show for it was a good time. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yeah. So, I say that to tell you, when I got a plan, when I started, because I knew I wanted to marry Tammy, but I also knew I couldn't bring $30,000 of credit card debt into a marriage. It would hurt. It was not until I got a plan and started working the plan that I started paying that off. And Tammy and I took this FPU class together, and we learned to talk to each other about finances. And it's amazing. When you learn to talk to your significant other about finances, it makes talking about everything else a whole lot easier. You'd be surprised how many people cannot talk to somebody about finances because they're embarrassed or they get mad. When you, learn to, when you learn to make it not a bad word, all of a sudden it makes everything else a lot easier. Finances, debt, tithe, these are not bad words, okay? They're just realities of life. Um, the next question, 
dovetails into that. I thought it was uh, very interesting, very good question. And it goes back to the heart issue. Could impulse buying, impulse shopping, and purchasing be a sin? Ow. <laughs> Could impulse buying slash shopping be a sin? I think that uh, sin by its very nature is, uh, sorry, I'm getting out of my swim lane here. You guys are catching <laughs> is 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 counter to God. So if you're doing anything that is right opposite direction of God, is a sin, or is is sin, right? Sinful. So if you so the question could mm -hmm. impulse buying be so if so as we as we already said right everything that you have is from God. It is God's. We are stewards. We are just here to manage it. And so if you know you have mounds of debt student, uh, you know, tuition to do, all, everything, right, the gamut, and you have no extra money, and you just go impulse buy, I mean, you're already, you know, you're, you're already tapped out, you have nothing left, you have no, uh, you have no margin for the kingdom, for, for what God wants you to do, and so doing that, to me, is sinful, whether it's a, a sin or not, you know, we, we can ask that. The single greatest gift aside from salvation is the ability to be content where we are at no matter how much or how little we have you can only have that if your peace is in God and your hope and your identity is in God mm -hmm. when we find discontentment I experience discontentment I use that as a red flag for myself to say, why am I experiencing this discontentment? And usually it's because I'm comparing myself to someone else, something else, or I need to fill a void in my life that should be filled by God. This is a hard one. I, I get it. It's like any other substance shopping is, mm -hmm. compulsive buying, right? It's not something that's easy to handle. It's a habit that you build that only God can fill the void. So, so sin, by definition, would be disobedience. So to whatever extent that it's disobedience, it could be, it could be the impulse of, of buying something that gratifies the flesh. It could be the impulse of saying no to something that the Spirit says to do in that moment as well, right? So it's, it's really the disobedience that defines sin. The one thing that, that I want to inject here is that you are not going to navigate your way to holiness and obedience in the area of finances through condemnation. Mm -hmm. You're going to do stupid things. How many did something stupid already this week with money, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so you're going to do stupid things. Now, I'm not giving you an excuse for doing stupid things, but it's going to happen. But the way out of that is not condemnation. The way out of that is, is aiming upward. The way out of that is looking to the Lord, looking to his grace, looking to for, for him to raise you up out of it, looking to one another for support in it, and then recognizing this, that there are a lot of things that are permissible, but they're not necessarily beneficial. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's not a sin necessarily to to go, you know, to just on a whim go spend twenty five dollars on a meal, unless you had to steal the money from somebody to get there to go eat it, or you know, I mean that would be sin. But it's not necessarily a sin to do that. But that's also not necessarily the smartest thing to do if a you weren't hungry and b a buck forty nine at Taco Bell would have fed you. Yeah. You know? So, um, especially if you already had designs and a sense of calling for what that other twenty three dollars and fifty one cents was for. Right. So, don't don't beat yourself up. Don't allow the accuser of the brethren, Satan himself, 
to speak condemnation over your life in the night, you know, when you're laying there with all of your regrets, and you're like, oh, because your $25 meal gave you a stomach ache, and, you know, whatever. Don't, that, that, that's not the time to sort this out. The time to sort it out is now and using some, some planning tools that set you up not only for obedience, but for excellence in, in what you do. All right, this, I don't know how this next one's going to be answered, so I'm really curious. Is there any such thing as good or healthy debt? Is that a, does good or healthy debt, does it exist? I can imagine that's student loans, house debt, you know. It's debt. It's It's debt. Can I say there there are tears? (laughs) There are tears? From bad to worse. Oh, not tears. No, there's tears. Years. Debt. Bad debt, worst debt, worst debt, worst debt. Credit yeah. cards on the bottom. Um, What's the worst debt you could have? Unsecured debt? Yeah. yeah. Credit cards. Casino. Unsecured revolving. The, um, I mean, I, I'll give you the, I'll give you the uh, textbook answer from the FU class is, uh, you know, the order of the baby steps is, uh, you know, you, uh, baby step two is paying off all debt. Every 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 debt except the house. So uh, if you think of anything, you know, a mortgage on a house, a house typically uh, is is an asset that appreciates, and so when you have debt on it, uh, you know, you're, you're you're paying interest on it, uh, but at least at least the asset is appreciating. If you if you're uh, paying a car note, uh, a car depreciates terribly, and so. If you think about that, you're paying interest and you're losing the depreciation. It's a double whammy who can you pay it off. But as far as good debt and bad debt, I mean, they're, it's, it's debt. But I would say the mortgage, you know, uh, being in a few, it's like the second second to last baby step to pay the house off and the car. So anybody? Uh, and one other point. Yeah. Um, so the, the business, business school side of me always conflicts against the experiential side of me, right? And so... You think about business and leveraging debt to get higher interest uh, return on your investment. And there are times and places that in the business world you can utilize that. For me personally, I've never found that. It's more of a personal stress transaction than it is beneficial. Simplify your life as much as possible. Be content. Keep it simple. There, there are so many ways to, to answer that question. I, for a long time, I was, um, I was a mortgage banker, mortgage loan officer, and I was really bad at that job because I tried to talk people out of buying <laughs> the house. I mean, I, I just, I was going. I mean, I can qualify you on paper for two forty, but you're that would be stupid, you know. And, <laughs> my, and my income was based on the commission on eight, on two forty, you know. I mean, so. It, the uh, debt, debt is debt. Now, let me, let me come back and just temper it, just if for no other reason, just to kind of, uh, to kind of balance it out a little bit into reality, okay? Because, again, you could sit here and beat yourself up with reality and go, oh, man, I already have already got a car note and a credit card and student debt. I mean, I'm, I'm screwed. I don't need to listen to, you know, this. And that's not the attitude to take. The attitude to take is to that I can do some things to start setting things right. I, d- I didn't have um, or, or either t- both didn't have and did not take the opportunity that some of you have right now. Some of you have no problem or a little problem or a lot of years ahead of you that you can, u- you can really use to leverage a life of obedience that becomes a life of success, which, by the way, is not defined in any way by your net worth, but right. totally by your obedience, right? So uh, you, you have a, a chance to set yourself up for success without a doubt. Now, um, let's, let's look at an example where you, you, you've got this great new job that you just landed for $50,000 a year, $80,000 a year. I don't know. You, it's more money than you were making yesterday and tomorrow you can start making that money, and your uh, $475 beater 
is breaking down and costing you $200 a day and you don't have a way to get, and you lose that $50,000 job. My practical mind says, I mean, you go before the Lord and you get his heart and, and you be as just blank slate, open and honest as possible and seek his provision. And if you wake up tomorrow morning and you, you didn't get a phone call that somebody's giving you a car, there wasn't something in the driveway that wasn't there the night before, you know, and, and you need to make the decision that there's some way that you've got to come up with dependable transportation to go make some money, that's probably within reason a smart thing to do. I mean, it's, 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 it's the provision that's there. It's something that's certainly permissible. It's not ideal. The ideal would be that before you ever get in that situation, you begin a savings plan and get to a point where you can continue to, to elevate your car game over the years and be a cash payer all the way through. But there's a practical reality that you can put it to that in, I just seen it play out too many times over the years and you get to a point where repairs are exceeding the what the it, and it's it's complicated calculations I'm not going to even get into but sometimes not the rule but there are times where the math works and that's just what you need to do in that situation but you do it with an asterisk beside it saying but I've but here's here's my plan to get out of that here's my plan to pay that off because I have this money coming in now, okay? So, so I'm just going to put in there the possibility of exceptions. Some of that comes from the, the business side because I have to deal with the reality of managing people's debt every day. Every, every day I see it. But ev what I will balance what I just said with is that every dollar of debt I manage has negative consequences attached to it. It ties your hands, it limits your options, it comes back and bites you that in ways that you don't even think of, with tax consequences, with costs you weren't expecting. With I mean, it just, it gets in the way. But sometimes it's the, it's, it is the reality of the world you live in as spoiled Americans. And just seek, don't, don't ever do it on an island, don't ever do it alone, and don't ever do it on an impulse. Have trusted people that you put in place that you talk through the options with and, and come up with a plan ahead of time of how to manage that and navigate through those waters. Yeah. Uh, we've got time for two more questions. I want to encourage you, these uh, volunteers, these mentors to your generation have agreed to stay um, for 30 or so minutes when we're done and they'll be here because we have a lot of questions we haven't got to. A lot of them are practical questions, like how much money do I, a lot of them would be mechanics questions. How much money do I set aside for this? How do I set up a budget? How do I start a plan? Those questions we're not going to have time to get to in this setting, so please come up afterwards and ask those questions, okay? We've got time for two more questions, and these are more uh, philosophical in nature, um, so I wanted to get to those while we're here. The first one, I love uh, because it has to do with being ladies and gentlemen. And the question is, folks, as a man, if I do not have money to take my lady out for the night, am I to put it on a credit card or tell her we're not going somewhere as a gentleman? I've been reading this question for like yeah. five minutes. I'm yeah. so excited about it. All right. I paraphrase. So I'm going to apologize first because I, I have very little empathy. Uh, some of you who know me know. Um, if you're in college and you have a part-time job and you have a lady friend, sleep less, work more. That's it. <laughs> Sorry. I worked 120 hours a week through college, stay out of debt. That's what it is. Boom. So Next. So let me be a little bit more romantic. Yeah, more romantic. So there are plenty of ways to uh, go and enjoy an evening together without spending money. Invite oh. Barry White. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> no. Right. Yeah. They don't know who Barry White is. I mean, yeah. Be creative. I mean, I mean, goodness, you y'all are way more creative than me. I'm just kidding. So you know, go to the, go to the park. Go to you know. There's ways when when. When uh, Jennifer and I were going through the first early steps of financial peace, paying off debt, doing things, 
we, we were creative with just, even, I mean, we had good income, but we were still creative on how we went out. And I mean, there's ways to do things and uh, spend time together, but not spend money, right? We have this culture that you got to go to this nice restaurant or you got to go spend this money. And it, I just I can't encourage you enough to fight against uh, that, that culture to just spend, you know, always spend, spend, spend. Don't, you know, don't go there. Mm. There's, there's plenty of ways. Be creative. That's the man keeping you down. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Ramen night. Ramen. Peanut butter night. Heck yeah. Dollar menu night. Heck yeah. <laughs> beans and rice. Beans and rice. Beans and rice, rice and beans. Beans and rice. You Catch want. your own food night. Hey. <laughs> We've done it all. <laughs> all right. Uh, did you want to well, add no, something, John? I'll just I'll just say I'll just say it this way. And I, I think, did you guys put the uh, the compounding interest tool in their hands? Is that in your hands? Uh, to the there or no? I don't know if you have it. I they'll, maybe, they'll maybe reference some of that. If not, they can point you to that resource. But think of it this way, very practically. For every, just take a dollar. You know, wh what's, what's out there for a dollar now? Some kind of taco or something? I don't know. But for if, if one of those dollars went into, went, was put aside for investment sake every day, and it just kept just one dollar every day. How many, blow, how many just wa like lose a dollar, blow a dollar, waste a dollar every day, and that goes every day. Then by the time you're starting to contemplate retirement, and if every day one dollar was set aside, that's now, that's now grown from the 14,000 or so that you built up, you put aside over 40 years, it's now grown to about $110,000, all right? Now, the same law applies only even more compounded. If you do a add a dollar of debt every day to mm -hmm. entertain the ladies or whatever, <laughs> then that you're probably, you know, if, if we're earning at an average of 8%, you're probably paying more an average of 15 or 20% Mm -hmm. credit card yeah. so think how much i mean so so that dollar every day that you went into debt to impress a woman is now in 40 years hanging over your head as a half a million dollars in debt and you ain't nearly as attractive by then either <laughs> so i mean let that stark reality temper your decisions and learn to cook <laughs> and he knows how to cook all right, last question, and then we'll have our parting shots, and then we'll close. If each of you could talk about the stress of money, the stress of, we've kind of hit the stress of being in debt, but the stress of being debt or the stress of having money, because both are a reality. It's Chad? pretty It's pretty easy. The, the Bible doesn't mix words. The borrow. The borrower is slave to the lender. So if you want to be a slave your whole life, stay in debt. I, I, I don't want to be a slave. And I can tell you that um, there was a point in time uh, when Jennifer and I were going through this, and we, hit, we, we were in this mode where we didn't own a house, uh, but we were tacking everything. And we got to that point where we were debt-free, didn't, didn't owe anybody anything. We have a mortgage now, which we're about to get it paid off too. But in, in that in that time there, yeah. was about a year. I can tell you that work was a whole lot different, right? I'm going to work, but I don't have to. I don't owe anybody anything, right? If you have no payments, I mean, you could grow some, you know, you could grow some fruit in the backyard and survive. And you know, yeah. I mean, it's just different. It's it. You are not a slave to anybody when you owe. The bank money for your house, for your car, for credit cards. You better go, you know. You better go get a job because you you, you got to pay this off. You are a slave. Um, the stress of money. So, I have been upwards of seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars in debt, personally, and I have been debt free. Um. It is no secret that I live a wonderful, amazing, fantastic life. And I love every minute of it. And you would be amazed at how often people try and make you feel bad for succeeding. 
It happens. It's a real thing. But I tell you what, when you pursue life and God first, when you love God and love people, everything else just comes. And when the money isn't your focus and you can give it away just as easily as you can make it, people can say what they want because then it's stress-free. You can come to my house, you can hang out, you can eat my food, you can swim in my lake because it's God's house. It's God's lake. They're God's fish because Lord knows I ain't catching any. <laughs> and the whole point is I will help any of you that truly want it with a budget. You can ask Lindsay, you can ask Brant, you can ask any number of it. But budgets are stressful. Because when you come and set up a budget with me, then I ask you, are you meeting your budget? Did you make your plan? There's m stress around money, good and bad. But what I want to encourage you in is love God, love people. Let God, let the Holy Spirit lead your decisions, and all the other stuff is just okay. Because it's not going to matter. It's just not. If I, if I look tired tonight, is that, that wrinkle right there, if I look tired, it's because it's, I, I've, I've, I'm, I'm in a season with several of my clients right now where just cash flow is terrible and debt is biting them and payroll is hard to, buy. and my job is just easier and more fun when I don't have to deal with that, when there's just money there to do the stuff that needs to be done. And that has not been the case lately, and it's wearing me out. And I, and I think that speaks to the heart of that question. If you want if you want to be, if you want to just be cranky and worn out and tired all the time and, and, and just preoccupied and, and sharp with others, then rack up the debt, all right? Just, just just do everything you can to make every stupid decision possible and you too can be miserable the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah. So, so you can go at this question so many ways, yeah. right? I mean, it's the writer's cramp from signing mortgages. I bought four houses on loans and the last three houses I bought with cash and you only have to sign like two pieces of paper. It's amazing <laughs> like, when you pay cash. Um, you know, every, everything's like that. So there's the simplicity of that. There's also the complexity of investment. And a lot of people say, oh, where do I need to invest? Do I need to do uh, uh, day trading? Do I need Bitcoin? Bad, bad idea. All right. Um, yeah, except for a few people. Anyway, and the concept, it's like working out, right? It's just save. Quit talking about the diets. Quit talking about leg day and shoulder day. Just go out there and move, right? Stop eating so much, move more. It's not that hard. Money's not that hard. Stop spending so much and save more, all right? But, you know, you can make plans for that. Cool. So the stress of money on that side isn't that hard. Now, in the work environment, I know Tosh deals with this as a lot as well. You know, managing, uh, I think, 40 or $50 million in portfolios right now. And just the people, there are people who you are paying for their children with the money that you are managing and the work you are managing. You have responsibility to others and, and that can be a stressful situation. And you need to take that with the gravity and prepare yourselves for when you work into those roles to be able to make wise decisions, wise, balanced, not reflex, reflexive, but very well balanced and wise decisions. And the, the Proverbs teaches us a ton about money and the wisdom that comes with the power of money and authority. So I don't, I don't mean to demean anyone. I don't mean to make things too light when I say just save more, work more, blah, blah, blah. There is, uh, what's this gray line saying? With great, I knew, I figured you knew that. Great power comes great responsibility. I don't know why, it's the shirt. It looks great. Um, <laughs> uh, 
great power comes great responsibility. Same is with, with money. And you guys are going to be, you're going to be fine. Get your heart right. Do it for the right reasons. Love God. Nothing else matters. Nothing that happens will sway you. Yeah. <laughs> Anything you want to add, Jennifer? I hate public speaking. That's why I hand it off to him. I have to say, first of all, I, I'm just in awe sitting here and seeing this audience that you guys have carved out time to be here and meet with God. He has met you here in your worship. He has met you here through, hopefully, I'm humbled to be a part of this panel and to maybe pass down a little bit of advice. Um, he will meet you wherever you are in your relationships, as you talked about last week. Money ties right into relationships uh, more than you can imagine. The longer you live, the more you'll realize that'll play out. Um, so I'm just, I'm just thrilled for you guys. I'm thrilled for the, the, what lies ahead, the plans he has for you in your finances, um, and that you're willing to sit here and listen to us. So thank you for, for letting us share with you tonight. Anyway. Before we close, anybody want to add anything? All right.